400, 600, 800 dollars all on Live Edge this month? <sighs> I need to do something to rein in these lumber bills. So look, we all love Live Edge lumber. In fact, I'm sitting in front of a Live Edge desk right now. But the fact of the matter is, you pay a real premium for Live Edge wood. In some cases, it can be as much as 50% more compared to conventional straight cut lumber. Which doesn't even really make a lot of sense if you think about it, because it should be less work to cut Live Edge lumber. But whatever, that's not the point of today's video. The point of today's video is to show you how I made this. This table has what at first blush might look like a live edge top but it's completely fake. I carved this top myself. So not only did I get exactly the size and shape of Live Edge I wanted, but it cost me a fraction of the price. Let me run you through a couple of features of this, and then I will show you exactly how I made it. So I think the first thing I have to explain is this big open area here, and that is just a cutout for my subwoofer. Over on this side, we have a couple of long glass shelves for, you know, knickknacks and books and stuff like that. And then up here, we have the top, which is 24 inches by 24 inches and made from a single piece of straight edge walnut that I glued together. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. It's 24 inches tall so that it's perfectly in line with my TV stand over here. So let me kick it back to myself about a week ago back in the shop and I will show you how I made this thing. Here in front of me, I have all the walnut I'm gonna need for this project. There's about 10 or 12 board feet here and it's eight quarter thick material, which is just a fancy way of saying two inches thick. So seeing as the top is kind of the centerpiece of this project, I figured it only makes sense to start there. So what we're gonna do is clean up this wood, glue it together and then if everything goes my way, we might even carve this today. Using my miter saw, I cut the rough walnut into four 25 inch long pieces. Then using my joiner, I squared up two of the four faces on each piece. Having a perfectly flat face allowed me to use my planer to reduce all four pieces to uniform thickness while simultaneously squaring up a third face. Okay, one last thing to do and then these will be all squared up. Finally, I used my table saw to square up the remaining face. I probably could have done this on my joiner too, but I think it's faster and easier to just do it on the table saw. Alright, so that's it for cleaning up the wood. It's nice and flat on four sides, it's all uniform thickness, and I don't think there's anything left to do now except for gluing it all together. I applied a generous bead of carpenter's glue to three of the four pieces, and while I couldn't find a glue spreader, I think my fingers did a decent job of spreading the glue around. After that, I clamped the walnut and let it sit for 30 minutes while the glue dried. If you look closely at the end grain, you can see that I've alternated the direction of the grain on each piece. This helps to counteract the forces of the wood moving and should help to keep the tabletop more stable over time. All right, let's get these clamps off of here and see what we're working with. Ugh. So there's some little ridges left over from the glue up. We're just gonna clean those up real quick on the drum sander. The drum sander is a quick and easy way to take care of uneven surfaces, but if you don't happen to have one, a random orbital sander or a belt sander would work just as well. It might just take a little bit longer. So now this is all sanded to 80 grit, nice and smooth. And we're just gonna take a second and square up these ends. And we're gonna use the track saw to do it. I did both of these cuts in multiple passes, and the reason for that is, in the past, I've burned up track saw motors by trying to cut too much wood all at once. So now, whenever I'm cutting thicker slabs, I try to only do a half inch at a time. So that's basically it for the top. It's glued, it's cut, it's all straight. And now we get to move on to the fun part of this project. So over here on my right, you'll notice this crazy sea urchin looking thing. And what this is, is a wood carving disc from Cutsall. So I'm gonna throw this on my angle grinder and then I'm gonna use it to carve away at this edge of the wood and create the fake live edge from earlier. I don't know exactly what this is gonna look like, but I'm just gonna kind of mark out some lines I think kind of fit with the grain pattern that's here. And then, you know, maybe coming down around here. So over here, I think I'll do the kind of opposite. I'll come in kind of bowl shaped here. And then not so dramatic through here. 
So behind me here, I've set up a little outdoor cut station because this can be pretty dusty and I don't want all that dust in here. So I figured this is a job best left for outside. I'm a little nervous to do this. I've never used a wood carving disc before, so this should be interesting. Following my trace marks from earlier, I used the coarse black disc to do the heavy material removal. Once that was done, I switched to the finer green disc to smooth out my carves. The trick to making this effect look really convincing is to follow the wood's natural grain patterns while you're sculpting it. Honestly, I probably should have carved this thing a little bit differently, but overall I'm still really happy with the results. This is fun, I could get into this. I was surprised at how quickly these carving discs were able to cut right through the walnut. As you can see, the teeth on these discs are quite aggressive. So there's a little bit of a texture here that I'm just gonna remove now with a random orbital sander. And of course, I always have to raise the grain on every project. I sprayed a light mist of water onto the wood, causing the grain to swell, and then I sanded it all back for an ultra smooth finish. All right, so I think we can safely say that we are done with the sanding on this project. That also means that we are at the end of the woodworking phase of this project. So we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna do a little bit of metalworking to build the table legs for it. Let's set this guy aside for now. And let me grab the steel that we're gonna need for this project. So this is three quarter inch tubular steel. I think it's 12 gauge thick. Almost all steel comes coated in a transport oil that burns off when you start welding it. So prior to working with it, I always make sure to wipe it off using some mineral spirits. And now I'm gonna use this cold cut metal saw here to cut this metal to length. I cut eight pieces that were 23 inches long with 45 degree miters on both ends, as well as six pieces that were 21 inches long with square cut ends. This cold cut saw is a new addition to the shop and I really prefer it to the old abrasive chop saw I used to use. It's much quieter, makes less of a mess, and it cuts a lot faster. Unfortunately, I still haven't found a metal saw that gives perfectly clean cuts, so I spent a few minutes using a file to clean up all the ends. All right, so I think that is it for metal cutting and metal prepping. Now it's time to start welding. I don't know if you guys saw my last video, but in it, I made this welding table cover that's extremely heavy. And if you wanna see how I made it, there's probably a link up here or maybe up here. No graceful way to do that. Start the welding here. We're gonna take our pieces that we cut and I'm just going to assemble the top and the bottom sections of the legs. Always a good idea to clamp things in position when you're welding because the heat tends to pull things in different directions. If you get everything where you want it and then clamp it in position. And to make sure all my 90s are nice and straight on this corner, I took a second and I just marked some perfect 90s with a Sharpie on the surface of the welding table. All right, let's do this. For the rough assembly, I just hacked all four corners together lightly using my MIG welder. And then once I knew everything was square, I fully welded together each seam. I'm still pretty new to welding, so my welds weren't exactly the prettiest. Not to worry though, because I used a flat paddle disc on an angle grinder to smooth things out. At this point, I was just doing a quick and dirty job to remove anything that might be in the way of the next steps. Back at the welding table, I attached the top and the bottom of the stand using the 21 inch square cut tubes, and then using the same procedure as before, I tacked everything together, and once I knew it was all square, I fully welded together all of my seams. Once my cube was done, it was time to install the shelf brackets. I welded two more 21 inch uprights into position and then four six and three quarter inch horizontal pieces. To make sure my spacing was consistent, I used little wooden blocks spacers between pieces. After the welding was all done, I had it back outside to clean up all of my welds properly. This time I spent significantly more time with the angle grinder smoothing out my welds and making sure everything looked pretty. All right, that's all cleaned up. Let's paint this thing. Actually, I forgot a step. Before we can move on to painting, we had to tap a couple holes in this so that we can attach it to the wood top. Drilling holes through metal is actually easier than you might think. The trick is to just apply a lot of pressure and use the slowest speed on your drill. Now we can do some finishing. So behind me here, I have the base and that's gonna get a rattle cam finish. And then over here, I have the top, which is going to get a brush on finish. I'm gonna try and finish these in parallel. So while I'm applying the finish to one, the other one will be drying. And then while this one's drying, 
I'll be applying the finish to that one. So to start the finishing process, I'm gonna be applying a white spray primer. I wanna actually paint the base black, but I'm gonna use a white primer because it'll be a high contrast. And when I'm spraying on the black paint, I'll be able to see any spots I miss really easily. If I had been making this project for a client, I probably would have opted to powder coat it. But since it's for myself, I'm fine with the $7 spray paint finish. I use flat black paint for this project for two reasons. One, I just really like how it looks. And two, flat paints are really good at hiding small imperfections. Okay, so right now it is incredibly spray painty in here. There's fumes everywhere. And you know, I could just open a window and, oh, that was a little too hard. I could just open a window and probably in a few hours things would be nice and clear in here and I could take this off. But when we were building this place, we installed a big extractor fan. So I just turned the switch and boom. So that fan is capable of moving something crazy like a thousand CFM or something like, maybe even more than that. In a few minutes, this whole place should be filled with completely fresh air. It's a couple minutes later, the air in here is nice and fresh again, and I can start applying the finish to the top. You just love watching the color change. The finish I'm applying here is Saman Stain Satin Hybrid Floor Varnish. I find it to be a very forgiving finish, and it also brushes on really easily. Between coats, I sanded the top using a random orbital sander and a 220 grit sanding pad. This helps to knock down any high points and makes for a much smoother finish. When it came to the live edge, I did the same thing manually using a sanding sponge. And of course, before applying the next coat, I had to make sure I vacuumed up all the dust from sanding. The second and the third coat always go on much easier than the first because the wood is sealed and it isn't immediately absorbing the finish the second the brush touches the wood. All right, so that's the last coat on the top. Just gonna let the base dry, and then I'm gonna bring it over here and attach it. The top is feeling nice and dry, so we're just gonna flip her over. Just as heavy as real live edge. And there we go. That is a completed end table. Oh, oh right, I forgot about the little side shelves. I guess we still have one more stop left to make before we can complete this project. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, 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 it's Zach calling. I need a couple pieces cut up. Yeah, so I need two that are six inches by 23 inches. All right, I'll see you soon, bye. All right, well that's sorted. Let's go get us some shelves. So my girlfriend has been begging me to build a project that isn't just completely made out of steel and wood. And it, it's fair enough, our living room is starting to look a little bit samey at this point. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to integrate a little bit of glass into one of my builds. Now, I don't have the facilities or the expertise necessary to cut glass. So I had to call CGA Glass and Mirror here in Toronto. They're my glass supplier for my construction business and they were more than happy to cut the shelves for me. If you need glass cut for one of your projects, don't hesitate to call your local glazier. They're usually more than happy to take on small little projects like this because it gives them something to do with the off cuts from their bigger projects. So with that being said, let's go get the shelves, install them, and then we can call it a wrap on this project. All right, got the glass, let's take it home and install it. So the installation of these shelves is gonna be dead simple. I'm just gonna use these little non-stick rubber feet, attach them to the frame. And then carefully slot the shelves into position. Perfect. All right, everybody, that's a wrap on this project. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and uh, maybe consider hitting subscribe or not up to you. I don't want to be too pushy. Either way, I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.